Hello, everyone, and welcome, and a very good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to you, depending on where you are connecting from today. My name is Anne Herod Lang. I'm the Executive Director of PHAP, that's short for the International Association of Professionals in Humanitarian Assistance and Protection. I'm delighted to be here serving as your host and co-facilitator today for our webinar entitled Guidelines on Inclusion of Persons with Disabilities in Humanitarian Action, organized by ICFA, PHAP, the IASC Secretariat, and the Reference Group on Inclusion of Persons with Disabilities in Humanitarian Action. I'm also delighted to introduce uh, my co-facilitator today, Mirella Shuterici, uh, uh, coming from ICFA. Mirella, over to you. Thank you very much, Anne Herod, and hello to all the colleagues. I'm also very glad to co-facilitate this webinar, and I'm really looking forward to the exchange with the speakers and you all on this very important subject. So with that, let's turn to the substance of today's event. And before introducing our panelists, I would actually like to turn first to you, Mirella. Uh, we're organizing this web webinar as part of the learning stream on navigating change in humanitarian work. And I was wondering if you could share with us why this is such an important topic to include in this series and what you're hoping that the participants will be getting out of it. As you know and have it, the International Council of Voluntary Agencies, IGVA, is a network of over 100 NGOs. As Director of Policy at ICVA during this period, I have seen a truthful commitment by all of them to be more inclusive in their humanitarian action. This interagency guidelines is an excellent tool that can help us all in our work. So as ICVA, we want to ensure that our NGO members, but also all other actors, are well aware of the guidelines and its content. We also want to support the translation of the guidelines into action on the ground. This webinar is for us an opportunity offered to practitioners to ask questions to the expert speakers on how best to implement the guidelines. We are also aware that the guidelines are only one of the various steps needed to improve inclusive action. So it would be extremely useful to listen from practitioners on the ground what else they need to ensure inclusive humanitarian action. Last but not least, I hope we will also have interaction among participants and that among our participants today, we have persons with disabilities who can directly make suggestions on how to better work together and be more inclusive. Thank you so much, Mirella. And to underline uh, your last points there, I encourage everyone connected in the event today to engage with each other actively in the discussion in the chat and also, of course, to submit your questions as mentioned throughout the event. Um, I'm quite sure that we'll have far more questions than we can address in real time during this hour and a half, but we are going to ask our panelists if they would be willing to answer uh, any questions that we don't have time to discuss today in real time, if they would be willing to, do, to respond to those in writing after the event as well, uh, as we do with, with all of our webinars. Uh, so now to launch us into our discussion, I'd like to introduce our guest panelists. Today we're joined by four speakers. Um, first of all, very happy to have with us the three interim co-chairs of the Reference Group on Inclusion of Persons with Disabilities in Humanitarian Action. Uh, so it's Sien Andres, Inclusive Humanitarian Action Specialist, for humanitarian inclusion. Welcome, Seen. Um, great to have you with us on the event. Is, we'll just check that your audio is working while we're here. OK, maybe we'll have to come back to Seen. We'll move on uh, to uh, Seen. Are you there? I heard a beep. No. Okay. So, uh, also very, 
Oh, hi, Scene. Sorry, I lost the sound for a few seconds while you were clicking me on. So no problem. Hi, good morning. No good worries. Morning. That's yeah. <laughs> good morning, good morning, good morning. Great, great. Thanks so much for joining, and and that's why we do a last minute check. So I'm I'm glad that we're uh, that we've got you on the audio again, and um, again a warm welcome to you. Thanks for being with us. Um, I'd also like to introduce Kirsten Lang, program specialist. Um, uh, on Disability uh, and Inclusive Humanitarian Action, Disability Section Program Division, UNICEF. She's connecting from New York. Uh, Kirsten, are you on the line? Warm welcome to you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. Great. Thanks again. Um, and uh, also um, among the uh, interim co-chairs of the reference group, we have Elham Yousefian, Inclusive Humanitarian Action and Disaster Risk Reduction Advisor with the International Disability Alliance, also connecting from New York. Elham, welcome. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. <laughs> Great to have you here. And we're also delighted to be joined by a fourth panelist, Alan Kalma, Global Humanitarian Coordinator with the Lutheran World Federation. And he is connecting here from the PHAP office in Geneva. He's been working on testing and implementing these guidelines, as well as other policies related to inclusive humanitarian action. Um, so very pleased that he's able to join the discussion today and bring some of that uh, practical experience uh, from that testing and impl implementation to the discussion. Uh, welcome to you, Alan. Thank you so much. Uh, pleased to be here and really glad to see the high level of interest uh, from uh, all over, really. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, yes, as some of you may have noticed who have been in other PHAP webinars, we are clearly breaking a record here with uh, more than 400 people connecting to the Adobe Connect meeting. And then I know we have a lot of people as well on the live stream. So it's going to be quite quite a lively discussion today. And we're absolutely delighted um, that this important topic has uh, garnered so much um, interest in the community. Um, so we actually have, we're already receiving a lot of questions. So uh, we're going to be incorporating those um, into the panel discussion as we move ahead now. And then hopefully also uh, having some time for Q&A at the end. But just know that as your questions come in, uh, we will be looking at those and, and working them uh, already into the into the panel discussion. So, uh, so to start us off and to ensure that we're all on the same page regarding the terms, um, that we'll be discussing today. I'd first like to turn to you, Elham, uh, to ask what do we mean with the term disability and uh, who are persons with disabilities? Over to you, Elham. Thank you so much for the question. Um, maybe most people take it for granted, but uh, we have noticed quite often that sometimes the very definition of disability is not clear enough. So I think it would be a great idea to have a very quick look into this concept because most of the time uh, people might imagine people with disabilities as just someone who is using a wheelchair. But the concept of disability is very um, diverse and more complicated that, uh, than you know people might first imagine. So uh, many people just uh, go wrong when uh, you know distinguishing between impairment and disability. Uh, impairment is a component of disability, but is not disability uh, entirely just defined by impairment. So, as you see on this slide here, uh, to define disability, yes, we do have impairment, which can be sensory, which means someone should, might be like blind or have visual impairment deaf or hard of hearing, or people with deaf blindness, then we uh, have physical impairment, which is pretty clear, like people who have um, uh, mobility limitations uh, or uh, physical disabilities in other parts of the body, the physical impairment. And then intellectual impairment, which is about cognition, uh, you know, uh, difficulties in, you know, cognition and 
analyzing, and then we have psychosocial uh, impairment or um, mental health conditions. And also we have other, like for example, we can imagine someone with disfigurement, uh, people who experience acid attack, for example, or, uh, or like severe burning, this is also another type of impairment. Then we have barriers. So what makes disability is the interaction between impairment and barrier. The barrier might be environmental, as you can imagine, like uh, having a, a latrine or shower uh, physically inaccessible is a barrier. Then we also have attitudinal barriers. Like, for example, someone thinking that a person with a disability is not able to manage their finance, this is an attitudinal barrier. And then we have institutional barriers, for example, lack of policy or legal framework to protect persons with disabilities. This impairment plus barrier uh, then um, ends to uh, lack of participation or barriers in participation of person, uh, persons with disabilities in accessing humanitarian program services or protection would create disability. So disability is a dynamic concept, meaning that someone may experience disability more in a situation and less in another situation. Uh, and it can be actually evolved. This is an evolving concept which would be changed and would be uh, altered uh, based on the barrier that the face. So we, we are talking about disabling barriers in the society. Bearing in mind the idea of barriers and always paying attention to disabling barrier would help a lot in uh, further actions that each of you take in your uh, relevant areas about including people with disabilities. Thank you. Great, thank you, Elham. That was extremely helpful. Um, there's another key term in the webinar title, inclusion. And for this, I'd like to turn to scene. Uh, this might seem like a very straightforward term, but we come across it in a lot of different settings. And your organization recently changed its name to include the, the term inclusion. Uh, so scene, what does it mean in the context of humanitarian action? Over to you. Yes, thank you for the question, and that is exactly uh, very true. We recently changed names. So I might be introducing three different concepts to make clear what we mean with the terminology uh, inclusion. So when we speak about inclusion, it's really a broad process and concept of systematically ensuring that all individuals and groups, they can meaningfully participate in all aspects of life, so without any forms of discrimination. So this might be, for example, political and social participation of women or inclusive education for uh, children with disabilities. Now, when we look at inclusive humanitarian action, it's about then promoting and respecting the rights of all individuals in situations of humanitarian crisis and risks, again, without any forms of discrimination. So here we might be looking at factors of age, gender, disability, um, religious backgrounds, among others and their respective uh, intersections as well. So it's, for example, looking at the rights of equal protection, access to assistance, access to documentation. So then when we further narrow down to inclusion of persons with disabilities in humanitarian action, we look at placing those rights of persons with disabilities at the center of everything we do. So to ensure their protection, their safety, their equal access um, to assistance, and this we do by incorporating those rights in everything we do. So as, for example, when developing humanitarian strategies and policies or when delivering services. Thank you. OK, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Sine. Uh We have a technical message from Marcus. Um, there's so much activity in the chat, he hasn't been able to, to get this message across. So over to you, Marcus, for a technical advice. Hi, sorry. So there are some people of you I can see in the chat who are having audio connection issues. Um, I would recommend all of you are using the browser version to log out and log in again using the app version. It gives you that choice when you log in. And if that is not working, then um, 
choose one of the audio live streams instead, and that should work better for you. Um, but if you're having the, the browser version, log out and log in again using the application instead. Great. Thanks, Marcus. And I think you'll probably post that in the chat again as well, uh, in, in case that couldn't be heard. Okay. Apologies for the interruption. Thank you so much, Sin, um, for the explanation. Uh, very helpful, again, to lay the uh, foundations as we move ahead. Uh, so now I'd like to turn to Alan. Uh, as you've been working to implement these and also previous inclusion guidelines, uh, could you share with us what are some examples of what this might look like in practice? Over to you, Alan. Thank you. Um, I think with this one, um, I, there's a question from Jane Buchanan from the US, I think Human Rights Watch. Um, she was asking about you know good practices on, for education on education for people with disabilities. And it ties in with what I would like to share. Like in Kenya, for example, since 2013, they had this act on uh, uh, this Basic Education Act, which um, necessitates uh, programs or schools to have an EARC, um, an Education Assessment Resource Center. So when we look at inclusion, it means uh, removing the, the regular barriers um, for, as, as Seen has already said, it's, it's removing those barriers for persons with disability to actually participate. Now, with the EARC, it doesn't automatically exclude or segregate kids who have disability, but rather actually conduct an assessment of their disability to determine what would, the be, what would be the best course um, for their education. So sometimes um, they get uh, mainstreamed into the, the, the regular classes, um, but with special attention from the teachers, for example. And then there are cases, of course, when they have to be separately um, educated. But I think just the the realization that it doesn't have to be automatic segregation and that we always have to look at inclusivity um, whenever we do programming for persons with disabilities is actually a very important point to make. Um, yeah, over to you. Okay, terrific. Thanks a lot, Alan. Um, so turning then uh, to the newly launched guidelines on inclusion of persons with disabilities and humanitarian action, uh, first of all, and this is over to you, Kirsten, why was this a priority area for developing new policy instruments? Over to you. Thanks, Anharad. So firstly, everybody, as everybody on this call is aware, not everyone experiences humanitarian emergencies in the same way. The way that people experience humanitarian emergencies depends on their gender, their age, and many other factors. And we know that people with disabilities are disproportionately impacted. So for example, some studies, including from the East Japan earthquake, found that the mortality rate for people with disabilities is two to four times higher than for people without disabilities. People with disabilities may be left behind when communities flee, and we've also seen examples of people with disabilities being targeted in situations of armed violence. We know that people with disabilities are at heightened risk of violence, exploitation, and abuse. So for example, children with disabilities are almost four times more likely to become victims of violence than children without disabilities. And as many of us are aware, these, these risks are very much compounded in humanitarian contexts. But it's important to remember that this vulnerability is not inherent. It's created. It's created by existing inequalities that are then compounded in humanitarian contexts. And it's also exacerbated by the way that humanitarian assistance is traditionally designed and delivered, which often creates barriers to persons with disabilities accessing protection and assistance. So, for example, 75% in a 2015 report from Humanity and Inclusion, they found that 75% of people with disabilities in humanitarian contexts reported not having adequate access to basic assistance, such as water, shelter, food, and health services. And 50% reported not having access to the specific services that people with disabilities may need, such as rehabilitation. So we know that a more inclusive humanitarian response will do a lot to reduce this vulnerability. What we often see in humanitarian response plans is, is generic phrases like people with disabilities are the most vulnerable and will be targeted in the response. 
but that's not really enough to address this, this high level of vulnerability. What we need to do is to change the way that we design and deliver humanitarian action, and that's what these guidelines aim to do. And so perhaps just to just to end my response to that question, to leave you with a few figures that give a bit of an indication of how many people we're talking about. So people with disabilities make up an estimated 15% of the global population. They make up an estimated 10% of children under 18 and 38% of people over 60. And this number is expected to be even higher in forced displacement context. So for example, a 2018 study found that 22.9% of Syrian refugees in Jordan had disabilities. So we're talking about um, a, a significant section of the population who's been very much excluded from humanitarian assistance despite being at heightened risk. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kirsten. Um, regarding the purpose of the document, we've had a number of questions come in uh, from Carolina in Sweden, uh, from Shazado in Pakistan, and also Barbara in Switzerland, all asking how do the guidelines relate to the SPHERE handbook and humanitarian inclusion standards for older people and people with disabilities? Um, why was there a need for the new guidelines given that these other instruments already existed? Was there a a specific gap identified um, and being addressed? Back to you, Kirsten. Great, thank you. No, thank you for the question. It's a great question. And I wanted to start that with my response by saying that we have seen an increasing recognition of the risk that I was just describing, the risk faced by people with disabilities. And we've also seen a substantial increase in momentum on strengthening their inclusion in humanitarian response. We've seen some really great examples from the field of how people with disabilities are being included. The challenge is, however, that we're not seeing this systematically reflected in practice. So, for example, we often see that inclusion of persons with disabilities isn't considered as cross-cutting. It's often reflected only in the protection sector, for example, or only in the health sector. And this is also reflected in the system that many organisations have where they allocate a focal point for disability who is often quite a junior staff member and doesn't have the influence to be able to work across those programming silos that we often see. We also see that often inclusion of people with disabilities is something that is considered to once the emergency is passed or once resources are available. So. We often hear terms like, for example, we'll address this once we've addressed the basics. But this is the basics. We, we can't only be programming for 85% of the population. And we especially need to place those who are most at risk at the centre of the response. So having, having ISC guidelines was important to really send out this clear message that inclusion of persons with disabilities isn't an optional, it, it's not an add-on, it's really core to the response and building on a lot of those really good examples we were already seeing in the field. Um, a key other part of the need for the guidelines was that we, we were often seeing that people with disabilities in humanitarian context were viewed only with a vulnerability lens and weren't viewed so much in terms of partners in the response and actors in the response. And that's something that we really aim to address with these guidelines, both through the process of development, which you will be hearing more about, but also in terms of the messaging of the guidelines, that people with disabilities are active in the response. Um, and the, our colleagues who asked these questions made a really good point that disability is already increasingly reflected in guidance. There are, there are organisational policies and guidelines, there are sector-specific policies and guidelines, but these, these are not so much systemic, they don't apply globally. We do also see disability increasingly refle reflected in that system-wide global guidance and the sphere and the humanitarian inclusion standards are key examples. And so the ISC guidelines really aim to, to build on and complement these. So going beyond identifying minimum standards to really addressing the what to do, how do we achieve these minimum standards and how do we achieve inclusion. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to uh, turn 
now to Alan um, with a related question. So, uh, Alan, as you've been working on disability inclusion uh, also before these guidelines were available, how do you see them relating in practice to earlier policy tools that you've used? Over to you, Alan. It's, uh, as you mentioned already, like we've been doing uh, a lot of this uh, work uh, for years now. Actually, it started even around 2012, I think when the Australian government, um, who is one of our donors through our partner, Australian Lutheran World Service, they were actually quite keen ensuring that disability inclusion is present in, in our programming. Um, and since then, we've been looking at you know various global processes that were available. At that time, there was an, um, uh, the ADCAP uh, uh, intervention to sort of like look at specific uh, uh, guidelines for um, older people and those with disability. And I think that was sort of like a starting point that we were referring to in that particular time. And then um, eventually, of course, uh, as you know, uh, recently the humanitarian inclusion um, standards for older people and people with disabilities have begun. So, and then now, of course, the ES guidelines came out. And we have the same questions coming from our programs. And basically, what we try to explain to them is uh, basically the ones in the sphere handbook, the humanitarian inclusion standard is a standard. And this guidelines, which uh, EASC has uh, released, is basically um, how to implement that at an operational level. Um, and this is how we then manage it. So from our side, within LWF, we try to develop our own guidelines based on the previous initiatives that I've already mentioned. And in for this recent uh, uh, version of our guidelines, we actually had a secondment from our partner in Finland, uh, from FELM. Um, her name's uh, Titi Matsen, uh, Matsinen, and she herself is partially cited. And I think for LWF, it was important to make sure that any discussion as far as guidelines, specifically for persons with people with disabilities, have to be uh, inclusive as well and have to include um, people themselves. Uh, they always say, whenever we meet uh, organizations uh, for persons with disabilities, they always say, uh, nothing about us without us. So. It is important for us to get them involved with the very first stage, and this is how we've been implementing this particular uh, guideline. The other aspect is uh, we really wanted to look at the guidelines as a way to operationalize how the standards are, and this was what was lacking, I think. Um, the standards were quite good. It was grounded on the core humanitarian standard as well, but it was difficult to interpret it at the ground level. So I think this uh, guidelines that we have now, they demystify this whole topic and at least help us be a bit more operational in our discussion. How do we actually implement this? Um, back to you. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so now I'd like to turn back to Elham. Um, as with any policy document, understanding how it was developed is critically important for then understanding how to interpret and implement it. And this is perhaps even more important with these guidelines. Uh, so Elham, you were leading this process um, and contributing to, uh, sorry, uh, Elham, could you explain to us who was leading this process and uh, and who uh, were all of the, the people, the entities uh, contributing to it? I know it was uh, a highly inclusive uh, process. Over to you, Elham. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Actually, the answer to this question would help a lot to understand the unique nature and uh, of these guidelines um, and their status. So, um, in 2016, we had the uh, adoption of the Charter on Inclusion of Persons with Disabilities in Humanitarian Action. And um, after that, uh, the Interagency Standing Committee uh, actually um, established a task team uh, with the mandate to um, actually draft the guidelines, validate them. Um, this task team um, actually had um, 140 members including UN bodies, NGOs, organizations of persons with disabilities, and uh, all humanitarian actors and governments joined the task team as uh, observers. 
the task team was co-chaired by um, a three of our organizations, UNICEF, uh, human, uh, as uh, representing UN bodies, humanity and inclusion representing NGOs, and of, of course, the um, uh, International Disability Alliance uh, as the network organization representing uh, persons with disabilities globally. Um, and the co-chairship of the um, task team with involvement of persons with disabilities and the representative uh, was a unique um, experience and yet very unique a new feature that was uh, experienced through the task team. So we hear that the guidelines are um, actually unique because they were developed with people with disabilities, by people with disabilities, and for people with disabilities. So over 600 people participated in a comprehensive, um, inclusive uh, process. So we had three forms of consultations uh, from starting from January 2017 until uh, mid 2019, uh, and you know that the guidelines were globally launched uh, in November here in New York. Um, so uh, we had global uh, cons consultations, and we had regional or in Latin America, Africa, Asia, uh, Middle East, and also in the Pacific. Uh, and then we had uh, thematic uh, consultations, for example, two consultations on uh, gender-based uh, violence and how to ensure that uh, issues experienced by women and girls with disabilities in humanitarian emergencies are reflected in the guidelines. Also, uh, the consultations ensured inclusion and participation of underrepresented groups. Because even among people with disabilities, we have groups that are more uh, underrepresented. For example, people with intellectual disabilities, people with psychosocial disabilities, um, people with deaf blindness, um, and other groups. So one example was a consultation um, uh, for people with intellectual disabilities in UK. It doesn't mean that people with intellectual disabilities were not included in other consultations, but this particular consultation was designed to ensure that they have the opportunity uh, to provide invoice and their uh, input is properly included in the guidelines. And then, of course, we had uh, validation workshops where uh, the drafts uh, of the guidelines were just discussed with all ver various stakeholders. So this uh, consultation process has actually provided the opportunity for organizations of persons with disabilities and people with disabilities themselves sitting and um, discussing uh, with UN uh, representatives, with NGOs and other stakeholders, and um, actually very uh, great network actually shaped out of those consultations. I have to add that uh, to ensure that everybody can provide input, the drafts of the guidelines uh, during the drafting process were translated into Spanish, French, Arabic, and also easy to read. For maybe there are some in the audience that don't know, uh, easy to read versions are um, a form, uh, and actually a form of translation, which is plain language based on illustration to ensure that people with intellectual disabilities, children, and those with a uh, low level of literacy can understand and can um, follow their concept. And these are very popular, actually, because uh, we, um, we find out that many people are interested in easy-to-read versions. And I have to also let you know that the, the final version of the guidelines are in the process of being translated into easy to read version. Thank you. Okay, that's great to know. We actually did have a number of questions uh, regarding the translation of the guidelines into easy to read versions. So I'm I'm very happy that that is under underway uh, and that you you mentioned that. Um, so thank you so much, Elham. Um, a follow up on that. So 
so as clearly this has been an example of an inclusive process. Would you say that this fact uh, also had an impact on the substantive content of the outlines? Um, what do you think? Back to you, Elham. Yes, uh, definitely. So, um, of course, I was not personally involved because at that time I was not working with the International Disability Alliance. But chatting with colleagues who have been involved, I have noticed that um, First of all, the language. If you look at the guidelines, you would see that the language is quite inclusive and accessible. And we use the right-based approach, the, uh, the, the right-based language, uh, which is in many ways the outcome of the uh, inclusive consultation processes. Also, many of the examples that you find uh, throughout the guidelines come from the field. And uh, this is due to participation of people actually living with this um, uh, conditions, like maybe many people coming from humanitarian context and also persons with disabilities themselves. And also, um, we think that this inclusive process has created ownership for uh, persons with disabilities and people working in the field about the guidelines. So, People with disabilities don't feel that these guidelines were something uh, developed for them without them being present. And that actually helps a lot uh, in the implementation level, which we are so much looking forward to see. Uh, you know, so most of the uh, outcome also going to be visible when we start implementing the guidelines more and more in the field and um, because of that ownership. Thank you. Got it. Thank you. Um, another quick uh, follow-up question, uh, again on the on the translation issue. Elham, has there been any discussion of translating the guidelines or uh, any portion of, or version of the guidelines into Braille? This is a question from uh, Evelyn uh, in the, the chat. Uh, IASC uh, webpage. There is page. Uh, there is a form format of the guidelines ready to be printed in Braille. So we actually, you know that Braille is such a uh, bulky uh, format because I'm blind myself, so I'm using Braille. So a very small uh, note would be a big piece of paper, heavy paper. So we couldn't uh, print it and we know that if, even if we printed all of it in Braille, it would be difficult to carry around. So what we thought is to prepare it in a format ready to be printed in Braille and put it online so people can access that uh, online and if they have um, printing machines, Braille printing machines, they can actually print it out. And of course, if there are in-person workshops, uh, International Disability Alliance, for example, itself is committed to provide people with accessible formats. So, um, the answer is that the format is ready there. If you have the uh, machine, you can uh, go ahead and print it for yourself. Uh, and of course, I would recommend that if you work on a specific sector, maybe you can just uh, pick that relevant part, your own sector, and print it in Braille. And if you have any further questions, you can, of course, reach to us. Perfect. Thank you so much. And I see that. Um, uh, Marcus has posted as well the link in the chat uh, that, that you mentioned there, Elham. Um, so uh, anyone who's interested can also follow follow on, along there to the, to the relevant uh, link online. Uh, so very good. So now to um, uh, I'd like to follow up a bit more on the content of the guidelines, uh, turning to scene. Um, what is the focus and the scope of the guidelines? How can you sum that up for us? Uh, over to you, Seen. Yes, thank you. So building a bit further on what the colleagues already introduced, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the content and the scope of the guidelines. So actually what we already have been telling in this webinar is that the guidelines are really about putting the rights of persons with disabilities at the center of humanitarian action. So not only as part of the affected communities, but as well as part of the humanitarian actors. So the guidelines introduce different types and, of barriers and risks persons with different types of disabilities might face in different types of humanitarian settings, and then introduce strategies for the mitigation and the removal of those barriers in a coordinated manner. 
So the scope of the guidelines is rather extensive as they cover recommendations for actors working across the different phases of humanitarian intervention. So we start off at the emergency preparedness, going through the response and up to the reconstruction and recovery phases. They cover as well different crisis types and response modalities, such as, for example, what to do in situations of displacement in urban and rural settings. And they provide as well recommendations for the different sectors of humanitarian intervention and the specific subsectors. So, for example, when you look at protection, you have as well a chapter on uh, GBV and on child protection, including to some other subsectors of protection. So, as a quick reminder for the four key objectives um, of the guidelines. So, firstly, we're really looking at increasing participation of persons with disabilities as well as their families and organizations of persons with disabilities. This across the different phases of the humanitarian program cycle. So as Kirsten introduced, starting really from the start of, of humanitarian interventions. So this by having participation as a key principle and, and consideration, as well as briefly explaining the role of organizations of persons with disabilities and ensuring that participatory mechanisms uh, and approaches are fully accessible to persons uh, with disabilities. So secondly, they provide guidance um, and practical strategies for different stakeholder groups over the various stages of the program cycle on inclusive humanitarian action and how to remove factors of discrimination. Um, they are built to ensure capacities are enhanced of humanitarian action actors and persons with disabilities and how to do this together with organizations with persons with disabilities. And as a last objective, we have accountability. So it's really about defining roles and responsibilities of different stakeholder groups and how to make accountable mechanisms more accessible, including as well how to enhance data on persons with disabilities. So that having said, when you look at the objectives, so the target audience is really broad. So we will both look at actors working at a global level and a field level from the humanitarian development or disability sectors. And we mainly look at engaging actors that are active in policy and strategy development, in budgeting, in coordination, and in technical quality and programming. So this all to say that, again, the primary responsible for the protection of persons with disabilities in humanitarian actions should still be the state actor. Thank you. Got it. Thank you. Uh, so given um, the, the rather wide scope, uh, how have the guidelines been structured? Um, uh, back, back to you, Seen, as a follow-up. Sure, thank you. Uh, so the guidelines, they've been structured in a way to ensure easy navigation, so you don't need to read fully through the guidelines. So actually what you see presented now on the slide is a content overview of the guidelines. So every individual or organization on the basis of his interest, priority, for example, the sector he works in, can navigate through the guidelines. So we will find three main sections in the guidelines. So one is an introductory chapter. There is a sector-specific chapter and followed by some practical annexes in the end of the guidelines. So when we look at the introductory chapter, we find back some of the legal and policy framework some of the guiding principles we've been talking about before, some of the key concepts and considerations, like, for example, how to enhance participation of persons with disabilities, empowerment, how to collect data on persons with disabilities, and those roles and responsibilities uh, which I was talking about before. And when you go into the sector-specific sections, those principles and key considerations are actually translated uh, over the different sectors. So this by introducing uh, the key terminology uh, of that sector, the barriers and risks persons, persons with disabilities might encounter to access services in that particular sector, and as well the recommendations on how to mitigate and remove those barriers really by using a twin track approach, so meaning mainstreaming disability and disability inclusion in all of the actions we do while as well providing a particular response to persons with disabilities uh, themselves. And at the end of every sector, we will find practical resources. So without writing them fully out, 
we make reference um, to further de details and technical uh, recommendations. Then to end, we have the practical annexes who really dive deeper into certain topics and uh, issues to provide those practical recommendations. There are seven practical annexes um, and they actually look at reasonable accommodation, uh, sources of quality um, of secondary data that might be existing on persons with disabilities, or for example, the indicators we might use to ensure we can monitor uh, disability inclusion. Thank you. Got it. Yes, uh, got it. Thank you. Yeah, we've actually. I, I'm glad that you mentioned the annexes um, and and their their practical uh, usefulness uh, as well as the other components of the guidelines. We've actually had a huge number of questions, uh, what dozens of them, more than I can more than I can uh, reference here uh, in the short time that we have. Um, but but asking um, uh, essentially how they can um, how they can most effectively get started using this tool in their work, particularly when they have limited time, competing priorities. Um, are there other tips or, or suggestions that you would have um, really looking at how how the guidelines are structured um, for these individuals who, who want to get started um, but are, are struggling to absorb uh, a 200-page uh, document? Uh, back to you, Sine. Sure. Um, so without reading fully true, there's different um, recommendations I could provide. So first of all, I think it's important for everybody to familiarize themselves with the introductory chapter. So at least people get familiar with the key frameworks, the key concepts, the definitions, in order to ensure we really address disability inclusion from a rights-based approach. So those can be found um, on a limited number of pages in the beginning of the document. Secondly, there can be a priority made based on the organizational commitments uh, and priorities. For example, if your organization wants to enhance uh, data on persons with disabilities or partnership or, for example, address inclusion of persons with disabilities through gender or protection mainstreaming, you can have a look at those particular chapters. So they're rather to be found in the middle of the document. Um, so in the English PDF version that would be, for example, from the pages 23 up to 41. Um, I think thirdly, you can navigate through the guidelines looking at the primary responsibility um, within the humanitarian landscape of your organization, but as well of yourself. Um, so looking at the annexes where you have um, practical checklists on roles and responsibilities of different types of stakeholders. So you might be uh, an NGO, a humanitarian responder, uh, a donor, or an organization of persons with disabilities with different roles and responsibilities. And fourthly, you can dive into the sector-specific chapters and look at what you might be doing to address certain uh, risks and barriers. Um, maybe to give a very practical example, so if you're a shelter actor, let's say, um, and you want to start addressing disability inclusion, so you start familiarizing yourself uh, with the introductory uh, section. Then you jump into the barriers and risks that are introduced into the sector-specific uh, sections to review, for example, proposals or to discuss those with teams on the ground. You explore some of the gaps in the entry points you might find back in the humanitarian program cycle uh, or the project cycle you are working on. And then you prioritize your actions based on that. Um, in order to address then the barriers, you can use some of the annexes and the resources. For example, when looking at shelter, you can access some recommendations on accessibility of transitional shelters or how to do inclusive community mobilization. And again, to, to make it reassuring, um, it's really to remind that inclusion should be a progressive and a stepwise process that should be addressed um, all together. So every systematic action and steps you take is actually a positive and a good way forward, I would say. Thank you.
Perfect. Thank you so much. That's very helpful. Uh, I see that we have a question uh, that's come up in the chat uh, from Jaideep asking about case studies, about how these guidelines have been implemented. Um, so for, for that, I think it would be very helpful at this moment to turn back to Alan, um, who I'm sure has uh, uh, run into um, uh, questions uh, uh, of the kind that, that we, we heard seen addressing, but also other challenges when supporting the implementation uh, of the inclusion guidelines. Uh, so to Alan, how do you advise those in your organization to use the guidelines, practically speaking? Over to you. Thank you. Um, as you mentioned already, the guidelines is over 200 pages long. And I think this is one of the things that sometimes people struggle. And I always advise the team to treat this particular guidelines as how you treated the, um, the sphere handbook. It's not something you read cover to cover. Of course, if you have time, please do so. Uh, read it from cover to cover. But I think it's meant to be sort of like a reference guide. So as I've seen, as already mentioned, if you are in this particular line of work in your humanitarian landscape uh, internally in your organization, then you look at this particular sections or the checklist. Um, if you are a thematic expert in your organization, then you might want to refer to those particular aspects thematically. But I think to resolve this issue, I saw a question earlier about how do you then, you know, reconcile this with the other protection mechanisms and, you know, standards that we have across. I think I would, again, would like to remind everyone that the humanitarian sector years ago has agreed on a core humanitarian standard. And we have to remember that the humanitarian, uh, the, uh, the inclusion standards that are now in sphere, they're actually based on the nine commitments of the CHS. So, if your organization conducts self-assessments or are compliant to the core humanitarian standard, I think you will see that it would the the other standards or the other guidelines relating to protection would actually fall in line. Like within our organization, we try to highlight, you know, within our child protection policy checklist, how does that relate with our CHS self-assessment checklist? And then you have a look at how does that relate with your inclusion standard checklist. Um, I think it's important, especially for HQs to find more and more innovative ways to reconcile or harmonize all of these guidelines to make it easier for our frontline staff. Um, there was a question on how this LWF plan to make the guidelines digestible for field staff. Uh, the approach that we've taken is to conduct a pilot testing uh, for the rollout. So before we actually rolled out, we did a pilot workshop of the rollout. Um, and I think that was, that was quite interesting. We did it in Nepal. And most of the participants were actually from organizations uh, for persons with disabilities in Nepal. As you know, Nepal is a very strong uh, DPO society, which is, uh, which is quite good. And we wanted to take advantage of the opportunity not only to roll out the guidelines, but also to sort of get feedback, initial feedback on the guidelines, the toolkits, um, but also of the workshop itself. And and I think one of the things that we 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 noticed there is language is indeed very important. We had to, well, I had to do it in English, and then it was translated in Nepali. And although the learning was there, um, when we did the post-test, there was a significant difference in the learning from those who spoke English and those who did not. So I really want to advise that when you do roll out the guidelines, which you should, and you, should, you shouldn't do a blanket rollout with a, you know, you, you have to make sure, contextualize it based on the country that you're rolling it out. Um, it's a lot of work maybe, but I think this is where you need to then um, work in partnership with the, you know, the, the DPOs or the OPDs in those particular countries to make it more effective. Um, the other thing that I would advise is, uh, I think Sian, uh, Sian has already mentioned this, this is not the responsibility of just one person in your organization. Like, you know, there's still a huge gap, and it's still an ongoing challenge. As with, you know, other areas of accountability, there's a tendency for us to compartmentalize and assign this as if it was a task and not a way of working. And I think this is something that we need to really find ways to sort of like have a discussion on this um, and not just assign it to certain or people in the organization. It has to be more of like an open discussion within the organization. Um, I think that's it. Um, thank you. Great, great. Thank you very much. I'd, I'd like to continue a bit more, Alan, on how you have been uh, implementing the guidelines or your organization has been implementing the guidelines. Um, 
we've already touched on this a bit, uh, but wh why would you say it was seen as important to use the guidelines in your organization? Um, uh, were, were there not uh, already organizational policies in place that were sufficient? Uh, back to you, yes, Alan. Yes, precisely. So there were policies in place, but I think they were more programmatic. So each country program, um, even within country programs, um, there will be a particular project. And I think this is how we've been doing um, disability inclusion for several years now. Um, it's, it's basically how we treated gender um, a few years ago as well. You know, like you have to have a separate project um, particularly to this, and whenever we do implement it, it's sort of like more on provision of um, uh, implement and tools and all that sort of thing. Um, and when we talk about mainstreaming, oh, mainstreaming, sorry, I personally don't like the word because uh, whenever you say mainstreaming and it's everyone's responsibility, sometimes what happens is it's no one's responsibility. So although I mentioned earlier that it has to be everyone's responsibility, there has to always be a focal point. But anyway, the problem that we had at that time was it was very project focused and we needed a bit more harmony in terms of how do we understand disability inclusion. I think that was the first part, understanding the why of it and then coming up with guidelines to implement it globally. So. For example, I already mentioned Nepal. Nepal is, has been quite strong. Kenya has been quite strong. Our program in South Sudan was also doing a lot of things, but it was not really linking globally. Um, so I think for us, it was quite important to have something which then ties all of this together. And I think, well, the, the inclusion standards was a very good first step, especially after being included into the sphere standards as one of the um, accompanying standards. But then when the IASC guidelines came out, I think that was really helpful because then you have something and you don't have to repeat or do the exercise again, like uh, somebody who already did the hard work for you and prepared these guidelines after a painstaking process. And all you have to do is now just make sure that your programs actually receive it. So I think that was, that was it. It was basically an idea of how do we harmonize, how do we look at it more as a rights-based empowerment approach and from a longer-term perspective rather than a project-specific perspective. Um, and finally, I think just, just highlighting the fact that I think this approach that we've had before in terms of the agency of people with disability, like we tend to think that they can't help themselves. But if you look at the OPDs, the, the working uh, organizations for persons with disabilities in certain countries like Nepal, they're really, really quite strong. And all you need to do is give them the opportunity to actually um, take the lead. Thank you. Got it. Thank you. I'd like to, um, yeah, come in with a question that's that's just come in from Samia, um, wondering if there are any tools available uh, for tracking and measuring program progress in regard to inclusion of people with disabilities. Um, are there tools that 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 you found that 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 you're using in your organization, Alan? Hello. Yes. So basically, as far as our organizations are, are concerned, we try to do. Um, uh, what you call this, we, when we disaggregate and collect data at the global level, um, we try to consider, um, of course, the disaggregated data as, as far as uh, um, the beneficiary numbers are concerned. Um, at the moment, we're still having problems with that because our system for data collection at the global level, the one which at the country level it works, but then trying to get this uh, segregated data at the global level is proving to be a bit difficult because we've already had this system which doesn't allow for such disaggregation. Um, so what we're trying to do now is uh, look into this uh, new system um, which allows us to identify unique uh, or uh, assign unique identification to each beneficiary. And then, of course, once you have the atomic, I think they call it atomic data. Once you have that atomic data, then you have a unique data point which can then identify each person. Um, and then you can identify what are the different aspects or um, categories or um, what's the word, uh, uh, descriptions of that person. So if they have a disability, and then you can sort of like have a look at that. Uh, but in terms of like monitoring tools, we just use uh, the CHS self-assessment tool, of course, and then the regular monitoring and evaluation tools that we have with specific uh, data disaggregation. Mm 
Got it. Thank you. Um, let's see. I'm going to, to take a risk with timing because we have such great questions coming in. And I'm going to pose another new one to you, Alan. This is coming in from Axel and has been seconded by several people in the chat. Um, so Axel writes, it's great to streamline disability inclusion. However, now there are three big reference guides, the Sphere, uh, Sphere's Companion, Age and Disability Inclusion, ECHO Guidelines of the Inclusion of of persons with disabilities, and now the IASC guidelines. Um, yeah. So we, we've touched on this a bit, but but Alan, from your perspective, yeah, why are there three guidelines? Uh, where is the coordination and the synergy? Less is usually more. He writes, I'm aware of politics and strategies and stakeholders, but we all want that the, the uh, content will be used, and this confusion could be no, an I'm issue. Actual, what are your like thoughts a, on that? Originally, when I first heard about because I was following this from the ad cap time, and when the humanitarian inclusion standards came out, and it wasn't, well, well, sorry, when ad cap came out the first time, it wasn't actually meant to be part of Sphere. And my first question is, doesn't it make sense to actually put it into Sphere? Because instead of having a separate guideline um, saying you have to do this for each of the thematics, why not just incorporate it in each of the aspects or the chapters in the Sphere handbook? Uh, but unfortunately, it didn't work at that time. However, now with the humanitarian inclusion standard, um, that has now been incorporated into Sphere as a partnership handbook. So there's already that link between Sphere and the humanitarian inclusion standard. And as I mentioned earlier, the humanitarian inclusion standard is based on the core humanitarian standard. Now, once you have the core humanitarian standard, which is further defined for persons with disability by the inclusion standards for disability. So you have already that link as far as the standards are concerned. Now, the standard is a standard. You need something to operationalize it at a country level. And this is where the IAS guidelines come in. What it gives is operational sort of like suggestions on how can you implement the standard, which was in the Sphere handbook, in your country program. I know, I hope that makes sense, it's a little bit confusing. I'm trying to do a, a lot of hand motions here, but I just realized no one can see me, so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, no worries. Uh, that's that's totally fine. Um, so, so now, um, so, so, so going going back to to um, uh, so, the, were there gaps already identified um, in how uh, how LWF was operating in this area? And and would you say the guidelines have helped um, in yes, those areas? Um, precisely. Like I already mentioned, the issue of data collection and data disaggregation. I think the guidelines provide a clear way for you to sort of like do that. The other thing is the intersection of gender and disability. I think there was a question from Emma um, from Yemen um, asking about, you know, how do you ensure this intersection between gender and disability? And I think it's in one of the chat boxes as well. A particular gap that we've always had was this idea of, or the concept of uh, um, intersectionality. Um, you know, like disability, well, before the intersectionality of the different aspects, um, you have to think about the fact that people with disabilities, they have different levels of disabilities and they, they don't want to be looked at as just one sort of like unit. You know, each has its own different uh, mechanism that you need to advise us. And I think this particular guidelines have a section on on uh, intersectionality, which is, I think, a very important concept to think about. When we provide support to to any of our beneficiaries, really, and, and also persons with disabilities, um, you have to consider the fact that there are certain, several different layers which make somebody more vulnerable than another. Um, and I think that concept was quite clear within the guidelines and was really, really helpful. The other question here was a challenge on Okay, so you make changes within your NGO and within the communities you work in, but unless it's supported by the local government or policy at the policy level, nothing will really change. And then by the time your project ends, everything will just go back to the way it is, unfortunately. So I think particularly from this question from Burundi, you say how do you involve local governments and which role do they play? I think they play a very important role. Anything that you do um, as far as, you know, changing, 
uh, awareness of people or understanding of people and how they deal with persons with disabilities will just go to waste if you're not backed by systematic policy changes. And I think this advocacy part is always missing when we do programs on persons with disabilities. So I think this is something that we may want to have a look at it uh, more. And finally, when it comes to, I think I mentioned it already, for an NGO, you don't, do you have to specialize? I think there's a question here from, uh, from Somalia, um, from Mohammed Ali, so asking, do you really have to specialize in, uh, as an organization, or won't it work better if you just link with DPOs? And, and to me, I think this is a very important question. We don't have to have all the skills that we need. It's all about collaborating with the right actors in place. So I think take advantage of DPOs if they're already there and try to work through them instead of, you know, finding ways to, I know, build your internal capacity on responding to this. Why don't you just collaborate strongly with them? And this has worked very well, um, especially in, uh, in the Nepal context. Thank you. That's that's really great to hear, Alan. Uh, it, could you tell us a bit more about um, so so now having gone through this process, uh, at what levels and in what areas of the organization are the guidelines now being used, uh, and how um, how uh, yeah it, it, on that dimension, uh, how successful would you say that well, the rollout it's still has an been internally? Process. So the intention is there to uh, launch it at all different levels. As I said, we've done our first uh, pilot workshop at the country level. Of course, at the HQ level, you know, everyone's convinced this has to be something that we need to do. I think the question is just about how do we harmonize all of this so it becomes digestible and accessible at the country level, not to mention with our local implementing partners as well. So that's something that is still in the works. Um, but I think be you have to have two levels. You have to have your management buy into it so you have that support. But your frontline staff also need to be involved because if they don't, if they're not part of the whole rollout and understanding of this whole um, concept, the guidelines and the toolkit, um, it will never really be implemented outside of their written reports. You know, like not in real life, just in reports. Got it. Thank you. And the uh, final question uh, in this round, Alan, um, would you say that there have been any, uh, quote, easy wins uh, when introducing the guidelines? Uh, or on the other hand, has uh, anything been wins, particularly difficult? For easy wins, I think uh, I difficult? mentioned it already. Um, when you do your pilot, when you do your rollout, when you want to encourage champions, I think you want to encourage champions within your team as well. So within the country programs, what we decide is to pilot and roll it out in countries who have already initiated efforts on it. Because then it was, it was easier to sort of like um, get that connection between the policy level and the operational level. Um, so I think that is a very easy win. So start with the, like what we did with Nepal. The other thing is to collaborate with donors and partners who prioritize this. Um, like just recently, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Australian funding mechanism ANCP. They recently released a Stories of Significant Change document. And in that particular, they wanted to capture impact of the projects that they do with the Australian funds. And in this one, we highlighted the program for um, disability inclusion in Nepal. I think an easy win would be to go to these donors who are already working on this, who are prioritizing this, and then work with them in further improving you know, the, 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 the interventions that you do within your organization. And I really, really think that it's important that you highlight the wins or the good practices um, in, in venues like this, uh, this stories of significant change for you to actually make impact and you know, encourage or inspire other agencies or other um, country programs or other people to actually get engaged. Great, thank you so much. Um, so now let's shift gears and, and look um, more at the humanitarian sector as a whole. Uh, Kirsten, I'd like to turn to you. Um, what would you say is needed across the sector as a whole to promote implementation of the guidelines? Over to you, Kirsten. Great, thanks, Anurad. It's, it's an important question, and it's one that we're very much looking to now because we very much want to ensure that these guidelines don't just sit on the shelf. So I'll share a few examples of what we've seen and heard from our engagement with humanitarian actors, but I'm also really interested to hear from those who are online. 
and understanding from you what you see as the key priorities to support implementation. So firstly, what we need to see is organisational change, so reflection of the guidelines in organisational policies and procedures, which is basically applying the guidelines to your specific mandate and operational context. And we also very much see the need for capacity development and technical support. And before talking a bit more about this, I wanted to very much second a lot of the comments that I've been seeing coming up in the chat box around the need to look at intersectionalities and to work very closely with colleagues working on, for example, gender equality, AAP, PSEA, et cetera. So we're very conscious of the proliferation of all these different thematics that humanitarian actors are engaging with. So what we'd like to see is that any capacity building and training on the guidelines is very much integrated into these existing initiatives rather than being seen as something parallel or additional. So for example, integrating into sector training initiatives, including through collaboration with global clusters, um, using the guidelines to ensure that surge deployees and help desks are well equipped to provide support on disability inclusion and very importantly, linking with those colleagues, working on those cross-cutting themes to ensure that we align our efforts as much as possible. We also recognise, and this is again very much seconding a lot of the comments that I've seen come up in the chat box and a lot of questions around operational tools. While the guidelines are, as we've mentioned a few times, uh, more at the how-to, more at the operational level, we do still need more operational tools and more sector specific tools in order to better operation line. We also think that one of the very important things to be working on is providing forums for exchange of experience and learning. And this includes, very importantly, forums for exchange of experience and learning between humanitarian actors and organisations of persons with disabilities. So for those who are familiar with the guidelines, you'll know that one of the key messages running throughout the guidelines is the importance of partnerships with local organisations of persons with disabilities. And often the first barrier to this is just really simply knowledge. So basically uh, having a simple understanding of each other's roles, each other's capacities and priorities and also for organisations of persons with disabilities to have those entry points to start engaging in humanitarian action. We see that as being really fundamental. Um, we also see that the... Sorry. No, yep. Sorry, go ahead. Yep, back no, to The you. last point would be that um, we think it's also important to have mechanisms to monitor implementation of the guidelines. So, for example, at an organisational level, seeing how the guidelines can be reflected in your RBM system. Um, at a global level, we're already seeing donors setting requirements for disability inclusion in funding proposals and reporting, and so the guidelines can then be used to guide those processes as well. Over to you, Anurad. <laughs> Got it. Uh, thank you very much. And um, just a, a follow up, Kirsten. So, for for further developments, um, so what are the what are the priorities for taking the the guidelines forward? You, you mentioned uh, a couple of points, uh, but are there other priorities you can uh, highlight for the the next steps of of development? Yeah, absolutely. So, as as I've already mentioned, we are conscious of the huge amount of guidance that's already out there, including other guidance on disability inclusion. So we really want to make sure that we're strategic about the rollout and that we're engaging all the key actors in this process from across the humanitarian system and including organisations of persons with disabilities. And we very much wanted to have a mechanism to bring all of those different initiatives together under one umbrella. So what we've done is we've established a reference group, a reference group on inclusion of persons with disabilities in humanitarian action, which will be a mechanism for collaboration on disability inclusive humanitarian action. And that includes both the rollout of the guidance, but also beyond to supporting disability inclusive humanitarian action more broadly. Um, what we envisage is that this group will link closely with existing mechanisms, such as the IASC results groups and associated entities, it will work closely with clusters and, again, hoping to very much engage with those colleagues also working on other cross-cutting issues such as AAP, gender equality, age-sensitive programming, etc., as well as supporting and reinforcing the organisation-specific initiatives. 
So in terms of practicalities, what this reference group entails, it has a, a tripartite co-chair structure. So similar to the IAFC task team that developed the guidelines, it will be co-chaired by a UN agency, an NGO and an organisation of persons with disabilities. For this interim period of establishment, that will be UNICEF, Humanity and Inclusion and the International Disability Alliance. Um, we've put out, and you will see on the slide on your screen, we've put out a call for organisations to express interest in participating. So anybody who's interested, please do be in contact with us on that email address. We're expecting to have our first call on the 11th of March. Um, and what our initial focus will be will be really to establish mechanisms for membership, but also to elect the co-chair. Once we have those formalities in place, then we'll really start the work planning. So a lot of these questions that I've been seeing in the chat box about are there tools for this, are there, how can we best link with gender and age, etc. that is exactly what we would like to see addressed in this work plan with all the key actors collaborating together. We also envisage that there will likely be sub-working groups on specific thematics, whether that be um, disaggregation of data by disability, having perhaps a working group working on supporting that globally. So yeah, please please do engage in this group. Please do reach out to this email address. Let us know what your organisation is, who is the focal point from your organisation, and we'd also be really interested to hear more about your motivation for participating in this group. And I look forward to hopefully being in contact with many of the people on the call today through that reference group. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much, Kirsten. And thanks also uh, to all of the participants who are who are uh, contributing in the polls. We've had very little time to uh, actually bring them up during the discussion, but uh, I know that they've really enriched everyone's experience. And I see uh, now a lot of uh, a lot of important suggestions coming through on the cur current questions. So thanks so much for your current engagement, and please do uh, take Kirsten up on her uh, on her invitation to to get in touch and be more uh, involved as well in the next steps. Um, so now I'd like to turn to Elham um, uh, to ask, what do you envisage the challenges will be um, as this moves forward? And how would you hope that the process will meet these challenges? Over to you, Elham. Yeah, I think uh, there have been quite a lot of discussion already about the challenges, but uh, I still think that we can kind of rephrase and uh, also highlight some of the issues. So personally and in my professional experience, I have noticed that uh, attitudinal barriers on stigma is a very important barrier. Uh, so I would envisage that um, we would encounter um, people that, of course, out of good intentions, uh, would be a little bit difficult for them to accept, to see people with disabilities as active roles. Um, so one thing that would help to address that would be not to seeing, as already was mentioned, but all colleagues before, not just seeing people with disabilities as quote-unquote vulnerable to be protected, but also as active role players. Um, so there was a question, I think, about what, for example, uh, about cash, cash distribution. I saw a question that was shared before the webinar about, like, okay, so we want to provide cash support, but people with disabilities cannot engage in casual work, uh, in the, for example, in the refugee camp context. I would say, of course, there are opportunities for people with disabilities to play active roles. And we need to just to be creative and believe in their capacity, of course, uh, help them to develop their capacity, but also believe that they can play active roles. And uh, one um, changing uh, point would be to see more people with disabilities working in humanitarian organizations. So back to your own organizations, do you have any colleagues with disabilities and not necessarily as disability focal points, but also on our other sector. The best uh, way to ensure implementation is to see, for example, 
gender focal point to be a woman with disability uh, or have in the group of youth uh, young people with disabilities being engaged. So not just people with disabilities should just only work on disability issues but on other issues. Um, having like if those who are in programming uh, level thinking about including people with disabilities as interns, as fellows, to give them the opportunity to develop their capacities on humanitarian work. We talked a lot about uh, participation and partnership with organizations of persons with disabilities. So um, to make these partnerships meaningful, we really need to see uh, plans to work with organizations of persons with disabilities to build their capacities to realize the significance of humanitarian uh, action, the role that they can play, learn about the humanitarian uh, discourse and humanitarian principles. And this is uh, something that needs collaboration from both sides. I know that there are quite a lot of organizations of persons with disabilities and people with disabilities themselves online uh, in this uh, webinar. And that would be uh, very helpful and really needed that they also take the initiative and approach humanitarian organizations asking for partnership, asking for assistance in building their capacities. Otherwise, uh, we would be facing a lot of challenges and uh, implementation would face uh, difficulties. Um, so I want to go back to the uh, issue of stigma again and say um, it would be very helpful to see people with disabilities actually working uh, on the organizations, not just as recipients, but also as uh, active role players. And that's the most natural way to um, combat that stigma, um, to organize in your in the retreats, for example, that organizations have to include people with disabilities to be there, because the most natural way is just to interact with people with disabilities. And I'm sure Alan, with the experience they have had in Kenya or Nepal, can testify on that, that when you have people with disabilities working with humanitarian actors, the change really happens. Um, also, on the issue of um, uh, mainstreaming versus focal points, that's another challenge that I would envisage would happen, that some organizations might end up um, appointing a disability focal point and say, okay, we have done that. And if there's any question on disability inclusion, they would turn to the and say, no, we have a disability focal point, and that's in their mandate. As uh, I think Alan was mentioning, we, we should adopt a twin-track approach. Yes. We do need a disability focal point, uh, but that disability focal point should have the authority, the mandate, and the accountability to work with all various sectors over the organization to ensure mainstreaming. And of course, the second track is to mainstream and not thinking that, oh, we have a disability focal point, so we don't need to do anything on the other sectors. So only through this twin track approach of, of focal point versus uh, plus uh, mainstreaming, we can uh, see real progress toward uh, inclusion. Got it. Thank you very much. Um, so we're, we're running close to the end of our time, but we've had so many questions come in. I, I'd like to turn to Seen, uh, if I could. We have had, I would say, probably more than 15 questions generally in the area of data, disaggregation, uh, identifying persons with disabilities, and specifically the Washington group uh, questions. Um, these are questions coming from Emma in Austria, from Eve in Democratic Republic of the Congo, from Raj Ratan in Thailand and many others. Um, I wonder if you could uh, just comment briefly, seen on um, whether the Washington group questions are the um, the agreed uh, uh, standard for uh, disaggregation, or what, what can you um, what can you offer the discussion uh, on that issue of data disaggregation and identifying persons with disabilities? Over to you, seen. Um, sure, yeah, and thanks for the questions. This is really uh, interesting and relevant to discuss today. Um, 
So data is really central in the guidelines throughout and as well in the particular data sections. So actually the guidelines have had a look at different data tools, data methods, and entry points for collecting quality data on persons with disabilities. And those different tools are actually introduced within the guidance. So we introduce the different uh, sets of the Washington Group uh, set of questions, so including the short set, the extended set, but as well the child functioning model. Uh, to identify persons with disabilities, but we refer as well to the tools um, from WHO who look at environmental barriers um, to identify disability. So coming back to those different tools, so the Washington Group uh, set of questions, they have been uh, tested out within an action research um, who took over three years in different humanitarian contexts, and they have been proven uh, to be effective. Uh, to collect data on persons uh, with disabilities. But that being said, additional data is still needed to really explore the risks, the needs, and the humanitarian consequences on persons with disabilities. So as an important reminder, it's really to look at what your organization is doing, what data is already out within your organization, but as well in the countries we work in, and then use some of the annexes to really look at potential sources of those secondary data and screen as well on, on the quality and implement useful indicators which might help you to take decisions for further programming. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. And I know there are a number of other questions that we won't be able to deal with now because we will have to close in just a couple of minutes. However, um, I'm hopeful that our panelists might be able to respond to uh, to those questions in writing so that we can include those in the event follow up uh, for all of you as an ongoing resource. Um, so now to wrap things up, I'd like to go uh, once more around our virtual table um, to ask each of our guest speakers uh, for any concluding thoughts they'd like to leave us with after this very rich um, and wide-ranging discussion. A lot of issues have been addressed here today. Uh, so let's go first to Alan, then Seen, uh, then Elham, and then Kirsten um, for some brief concluding remarks. So over to you, Alan. Thank you. No, um, just really thank you for the opportunity to share our experience. Um, and I really see here, for example, Axel kept on saying nothing about us without us. And I cannot emphasize that any further. I think uh, Elham also mentioned it. Um, doing this without, you know, having the, the people themselves uh, participate in the aspects of work, like they're not just there waiting for our support. They're just there um, as our partners in, in this whole thing. Um, one thing that I would really want to highlight is for you as an organization, I think within our organizations, we need to have a discussion more than just rolling out the guideline, to have a discussion on why. Um, why are we doing this? Um, and why is this important to our organization? I think once we understand your organization's answer to that particular question, it's going to be a lot easier for your staff in the field and also in HQ to understand what you're actually doing. Um, and so I think it's important to start with the why and then, you know, explain to them all these available guidelines and tools that are already available to actually implement that. Um, and the answering of the question of why really depends on from culture to culture on how you'll be able to manage that, but I think it's an important discussion to have within your organization. Um, the second aspect is I really want to highlight again that you know, we as humanitarians, we agreed on a core humanitarian standard years ago. And I think as far as this particular uh, guidelines are concerned, these are rooted from the core humanitarian standard. So I would really encourage everyone to conduct self-assessments and see how that could be your springboard for all the different protection mechanisms that are available out there. But uh, really, thank you for participating. And um, I'm looking forward to um, future discussions relating to this. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you so much, Alan, for joining us. It's been really helpful to have your uh, experience uh, as, as part of the conversation. So thank you very much. Um, over to you, Seen, for concluding uh, thoughts. Yes, thank you. Again, I want to highlight as well that it's really nice to see this rich participation from different uh, regions, but as well from different backgrounds. 
I think for me it's important to highlight that this really is about the joint efforts and we're just in the starting blocks, although a lot of policies and guidelines have been developed. It's not longer about why we need to be inclusive, but really, as Alan is saying as well, like how to be inclusive. But seeing the questions and the curiosity, I think we really have a potential of being responsive and actually maybe transformative as well in what we do. And for me, it's really now about balancing what we do at a global level in combination with what is happening at the field level and really making available those learnings and technical expertise. Thank you. Right, thank you, uh, and thank you very much, Sine, for your contributions today, uh, very much helping uh, everyone to understand and I think make first steps uh, to digesting and, and starting to implement the guidelines. Uh, over to you, Elham, for your concluding remarks for the day. Thank you so much for this opportunity, and I really hope that I saw this um, poll question coming up about future and topics of interest, and I really look forward to having more and more opportunities like this to discuss uh, various aspects of the garden and maybe going uh, deeper into uh, specific sectors. Uh, so I just wanted to end up with two small uh, points. Number one is that um, for just do go after partnerships. If you are an organization of persons with disabilities, uh, Try to look for humanitarian organizations in your uh, country, uh, local, national, or regional level, and contact them and try to establish uh, relationships with them. Try to build the capacity of your members uh, about humanitarian and try to offer your input. And if you are in a humanitarian organization, uh, look for organizations of persons with disabilities in your area. If there are not enough organizations, maybe look for experts or advocates and try to support them and try to you know, provide uh, input to them about humanitarian action. And secondly is uh, the organizational change and, you know, the importance of uh, including disability inclusion from the very outset. Most of the times just adding a, a checkpoint on uh, accessibility in the procurement checklist, for example, or service provision checklist would make the issue of inclusion much easier than if you just are, are in the process of providing a particular support or service and then just thinking about how to make it inclusive. So uh, thinking at the uh, planning level, um, and for this we have wonderful guidance and support available in uh, HNO HRPs that um, for those in the programming can also enjoy. So think uh, well in advance. And thank you so much and look forward to future opportunities. Thank you, Elham. It's really been a pleasure um, having you part of the webinar. And I can see in the chat uh, your contributions were tremendously appreciated. So thank you so much um, uh, for everything that you offered today. And I also want to underline, as you did, um, uh, the uh, possibility of uh, future conversations. There's currently a poll up looking at potential topics which might be of interest for a future webinar. Uh, we, very, we all uh, very much look forward to seeing what you think, uh, all of you as participants, about where the conversation can go next. Uh, so thanks again, Alham. Uh, really terrific to work with you on this. And Kirsten, last but not least, over to you for your closing remarks for today. Great. Thank you. And thank you again for the opportunity to be part of the discussion. It was really great to see all of the rich input coming in through the chat box. And I'm very much looking forward to hopefully working with many of the people who were online today through the reference group. Um, I probably don't have much to add on to what the other panelists have already said. I think all the key points are, are very much covered. Um, just to second what Dean said as well, that it's so positive that there is so much momentum and interest in this issue. We're certainly not in a position anymore where the question of should people with disabilities be included is being asked. It, it's very clear that there is a strong commitment to this issue and the question now is one of how. And on that, it does, it, it does require commitment and it does require deliberate action, but there are many basic things that can be done and are already being done in the field in many places. So I would just encourage everybody to both have a look at the guidelines to see some of those very practical actions that are included in there 
and to reach out to local organisations of persons with disabilities who are really the experts here and um, very important to, as has been mentioned throughout the webinar, to engage organisations of persons with disabilities as partners in the response. So thank you again. Thanks so much, Kirsten. Um, and, and now, uh, so my co-facilitator from ICFA, Mirella here, has been listening very closely uh, to all of the discussion, which has been a challenge because there's been a lot going on. Um, and I apologize there that we're a bit over time, but I think it's very important uh, to ask her to share uh, some of the key points that she heard coming up uh, throughout the last hour and a half. So Mirella, if I may, I'd like to turn to you, uh, if you can provide us a kind of a wrap up uh, key points. That would be terrific. Yes, sure. I was very silent because uh, I was uh, listening and it was extremely interesting. So thank you very much. Thank you to the speakers, but also thank you to all the participants, not only for the questions, but also for some of the solutions that uh, they provided directly. Um, so how to summarize this? Maybe I will start with a key point, and that is for me that persons with disabilities are not vulnerable per se. Uh, we heard how it is the barriers that place them in a vulnerable situation. First, for me, removing these barriers would support persons with disabilities to better access their rights. Of course, this might prove more difficult in humanitarian situations, but as we heard throughout this webinar, this is not impossible. On the contrary, we heard very clearly from the speakers and also from participants agreeing that this is an inherent part of a humanitarian action. Then we spoke concretely about the guidelines and how they assist us operationally. And from what I heard, some of the guidance provided are quite straightforward. For example, if we think about the distribution sites, we should make sure that they are placed in locations which are accessible to everyone, including persons with disabilities. Or when persons with disabilities cannot reach such sites, then organizations should think about reaching out to to them with services and uh, items. Um, there are some other cases, and we heard about them as well, which might prove more difficult, which require more innovative thinking and action. Um, Alan and Kirsten also gave us some tips on how to implement the guidelines on the ground by having country pilots and looking at it not simply as a time-bound project but as an ongoing investment. We heard about sector-specific tools development, the need to invest in capacity development, to have technical support, advocacy towards government, and we also heard on working better with government and donors as strong partners in moving forward this agenda. So I think a lot to be done and not only easy, but it was also great to hear that the reference group is uh, starting its work and it's there to, to provide support to organizations willing to do better. And already I think they have a number of questions to look at. Uh, through this webinar and I would encourage you all to keep contacting them for more support and uh, more concrete questions you, you might have. As ICFA, we are also glad to, to facilitate this process, not by having the expertise ourselves, but of course making the link with other organizations and other experts that have this, uh, this expertise. Um, this said, I also think that why having technical support is very important. What came out of a, workshop, of a webinar is that with a strong institutional com uh, commitment and the right approach by each professional, much more can be done and be achieved. And what do I mean by the right approach? Very simple, having the reflection to see whether there is any barrier to our action being inclusive, 
then reaching out to the person concerned and asking them how they think that barrier can be removed and how we can work together to remove that barrier. So thank you so much, Mirella. Um, and uh, thank you once again to everyone who was uh, able to join. Uh, there will be a recording of the event, both in video and in audio formats uh, that will be those will both be available on the event page in the coming days and um, as mentioned we have a poll uh, have had a poll up about what related topics would be most of interest to you for future webinars uh, there has been a tremendous amount of interest uh, in this topic and we do hope to be able to organize additional events so uh, we look forward to to looking at all of your feedback in that regard uh, separately I wanted to mention that next month PHAP will be organizing an event together with the Steering Committee for Humanitarian Response on a related topic, that's participation in practice and the grand bargain, examples of inclusive action for a participation revolution. So if you're interested in learning more, you can read about that upcoming event on the event page and you can register already today. Uh, so with that, I would like to once again thank everyone, both panelists, participants, and uh, co-hosts from ICVA for a very interesting discussion. We look forward to having you with us again next time. With that, this is Inherit Lang signing off from Geneva.